Hey everyone, it's Ali and today we're back with another guide for the launch of Last Epoch that I am so excited to finally bring you. Today we're going to be talking about Void Knight Auto Bomber. This is the build that made me go from thinking Last Epoch is a decent game to absolutely falling in love with the game. This build is fast, it's tanky, and it's probably one of the best builds you can actually play for a season launch. This build requires absolutely no uniques to get going and there's no uniques that you're ever going to really want in this build until the super end game min-max version of it. Because of that and because of the speed that it's going to have, you are going to tear through monoliths faster than pretty much every other build and because of the way it scales and how easy it is to scale it you're going to be doing great damage from the moment that you swap to the build halfway through the leveling experience all the way up until empowered monoliths with absolutely zero problem because you have no uniques getting resistances on your gear and getting tanky stats is going to be basically free and because this build scales off of vitality that means you're just scaling health to gain more damage in the build this build is up there in terms of power and i would classify it as a s tier build with things such as umbra blades swipe most rune master builds and most marksman builds and i think it's going to be a build that a lot of people are going to enjoy playing. The other nice thing about it is, is as you progress it and as you get things such as the experimental haste booth mod which is going to give you haste you are going to be able to go even faster allowing you to pretty much farm monoliths faster than pretty much anyone else at the start of a season meaning if you want to abuse the early economy if you're playing trade you can very much easily do that pushing to a few hundred corruption is substantially faster than other builds while at the same time if you want to play ssf this will be a really good build to be able to farm whatever you need if you want to play a different build that requires specific items to get going just because this build doesn't need anything itself and you could get all the gear they need for this while farming for whatever build you want to play now i do want to add a disclaimer on here that this build guide will come out before the patch notes and there is a small chance some things about this build might get changed if something does get changed i'll leave a pinned comment in the comments below and i will have an update in the description as well with any changes but realistically the chances of anything being changed are very small simply due to this build already having nerfed in the past and it's at this point not overpowered but just very strong and the void knight mastery overall is i would say substantially weaker than other masteries currently void knight's missing any sort of good defensive layer but luckily we can make up for that pretty easily with the ways we're going to be scaling this build. So I can expect that the defensive portion of Void Knight might be getting buffed a little bit and we might overall have some really nice changes to it. But if that doesn't happen, then there most likely will be no nerfs. The next thing we should talk about is going to be the red guide that's going to come with this build. In the description below, I will have a link to Last Epoch Tools. And on this website, I have made a whole Wikipedia article for Void Knight Auto Bomber. This is going to basically go over everything that we're going to be going over in this build guide, except it's going to be in a written format. So if you prefer to read everything, I would encourage you to go here. And if you need a quick brush up on anything I mentioned here, as well as a little bit more detail than what we're going to be going over in here, I would definitely recommend to go through the build guide. Not only that, but there will also be a link to the build planner which is just going to show you everything you need to know for the build immediately you can see the skills that we're going to want here as well as the skill tree progression to know how to put all the points into the skills as well as being able to see the passive tree which is also going to have a progression allowing you to see exactly how to put all the passive points required for this build and the final thing to mention is that this build will have a dedicated loot filter that's going to come with it this is a loot filter that i've personally gone through and validated myself to be as easy as possible to follow along and it's going to be both great for leveling as it's going to have a lot of leveling rules in here make sure you're always seeing relevant gear as well as it being a pretty decent end game filter that's going to show you everything that you're going to actually want to see once you get to the end game so now that we've gotten all that out of the way why don't we first start talking about how to actually level this so unfortunately you're not going to be able to play the build immediately we need to get to about level 27 to unlock devouring orb on the passive tree as well as needing to get to about level 34 to be able to pick up renouncements which is going to allow us to start scaling smite until we do get to that point what we're going to be doing is we're going to be leveling with hammer throw now hammer throw is going to make your leveling experience really easy simply because it's so simple to scale all you're going to really want to look for while leveling with hammer throw is going to be throwing damage on your belt, your gloves, your relic, and your amulet, as well as the hybrid throwing damage and reduced mana cost roll on your rings. Now, I cannot stress enough how important getting these rolls will be. Hammer throw will have quite a high mana cost, and because of this, you're going to really need to keep this ring prefix on both of your rings to not struggle with your mana. The lid filter is going to have a specific section on it that is going to highlight every single throwing based mod for you while you're leveling before you fully swap over to the build. And I would highly recommend to never swap off of these reduced mana costs for throwing skills rings until you get another one with those rolls on it. As for how you're going to actually put hammer throw together, it's going to be very simple. At level three, you are going to unlock hammer throw and then at level four, you're going to specialize into it. Now, leveling with hammer throw is going to be very simple. And in the description below, I will have a link to another build planner that is going to show you exactly all the points that you're going to want to put in the progression for it until we're ready to play our build. 
The TLDR of how you're going to be leveling the hammer throw is going to be very simple. First, we're going to want to make our way to Iron Spiral. This is going to make it so our hammers spin in a circle around us, allowing us to multi-hit enemy. What we're then going to want to do is immediately go to the right side and then get pick up Catapult. Catapult is going to give us additional projectiles, meaning we're going to get multiple hits in total, meaning that we're going to be able to scale off of additional throwing damage substantially easier. We're then going to want to pick up Avatar of the Spire. Now, Avatar of the Spire is going to attempt to make the hammers be thrown a Nova, but... The Iron Spiral takes precedence over it, meaning that Avatar the Spire is just going to give us double projectiles and a bunch of added fizz damage. Finally, we are going to put a few points into Ballista, which is going to reduce the mana cost of it, make it a little bit easier to play. And whenever you're ready and you don't need more points in Ballista, you can finally pick up Hammer Vortex, which is going to make it cost even more mana, but it's going to make it so the hammers spin around you, allowing you to attack a few times, make a few spinning hammers, and just keep moving forward and allowing those to pretty much clear everything for you. This is going to be very easy to level with, and you're going to have absolutely zero problems getting to 27. Now, what I want to mention here is going to be to pick up the skills you're going to be needing earlier. Once you unlock Smite at around level 15 or so, you're going to want to put it in your second specialization slot. We're not going to actually be pressing Smite because it's just going to kill us and it's going to do zero damage, but we just want to be specialized in it so we can gain experience and be ready to be used once we're ready to swap off of Hammer Throw as it's going to be our main DPS afterwards. The other thing to mention here is Devouring Orb. You're going to be unlocking Devouring Orb at level 15. It's going to be the main bread and butter of this build once we start playing it. Now, you're not going to be able to play it immediately as you're going to need to put 10 points into Devouring Orb to pick up points such as Dark Moon and Cosmic Impact, as well as picking up 4 points in Chaotic Torrent. Chaotic Torrent is going to increase the frequency of orbs that you're going to get from Abyssal Emission. It's going to be where the majority of your damage for your Devouring Orbs is going to come from early on. Once you do get 10 points in Devouring Orb, you can actually start playing it alongside Hammer Throw, where you would just use Devouring Orb on cooldown and then keep throwing hammers, and then you just benefit from both at the same time. You can then also use the Numlock trick to be able to Numlock your Devouring Orb, which we'll talk about later in the video, and then that way you can just automatically cast them and then just keep playing the build as if you're a hammer throw build. Finally, once you're at level 34, we'll finally have enough passive points to be able to pick up Renouncement on the tree. At that point, you are going to be able to play with Smite as it's going to make Smite do a lot more damage. At that point, we can finally despecialize out of hammer throw and just be able to play our build as it is. From here on out, you can simply just keep putting points in your passive tree, eventually unlocking things such as Anomaly and eventually unlocking things such as Sigil of Hope. And at that point, you'll be at end game and you'll have no problems continuing on. So next up, we should talk about how this build actually works. So this build is going to be very simple. We're going to have two main skills that we want to use. First, we're going to have Devouring Orb, which is going to be doing the majority of work for us in terms of clearing. And the way Devouring Orbs is going to be very simple. The orbs themselves are going to be orbiting around you because we're going to be picking up Dark Moon, which is going to do hit damage anytime it hits an enemy, which is going to be greatly increased by Cosmic Impact. And every time an enemy near you dies, all of your Devouring Orbs will do an AoE. Not only that, but your Devouring Orbs will also be consistently spawned auto-seeking balls through Abyssal Emission, which are going to be spawning very, very quickly through the point Chaotic Torrent. All you're going to be doing this build is you're going to be pressing Devouring Orb on cooldown and you're just going to be walking forward. The Devouring Orbs are going to kill things for you and they're going to pretty much do all of your clearing. And because we're playing this as a Void Knight, all abilities we do have a 10% chance to be echoed, which is then further increased with putting 5 points in Echoing Strikes and 1 point in Avatar of Regret, giving us an end game a 30% chance that every time we press a Devouring Orb, we will immediately cast a second one for free that's going to be just as strong as the original Devouring Orb. This means late game, once you have enough cooldown reduction, you are going to be having somewhere around five to six orbs around you at all times. They're going to be spewing out a lot of Abyssal Orbs. And every time you are going to kill a monster, all of them are going to do a big AoE, which can overlap with each other. The other thing that we're going to be adding onto this is going to be Smite. Smite is going to be turned into a Void Skill through Temporal Corruption. And then we're going to be turning it into Vitality Scaling through Renouncement. The reason we care about this is because Devouring Orb is going to be gaining added damage through Vitality and that's going to be the main way to scale it and that way we can also scale smite at the same time Smite is going to be how you're going to be killing bosses you don't ever really need to press smite outside of anything but a major boss and the nice thing is is you can weave devouring orbs between your smites greatly increasing your dps the final thing to mention about all this is we're going to be picking up lunge and the nice thing about lunge is that it's going to have the point holy incursion which makes it so when you lunge you're going to be casting a bunch of smites for free on top of enemies these smites will benefit from your smite tree and that means you'll get very powerful points such as pillars of light potentially giving you a free double cast as well as it applying your echo chance meaning every time you lunge forward into a pack which is going to make your devouring orbs immediately hit enemies and you're going to get a bunch of free smites those free smites can then further echo potentially giving you something like five or six free smites every time you lunge greatly increasing the amount of clear that you have these two skills are going to be your bread and butter along with lunge and they're going to basically be doing all the work for you in terms of clearing monoliths now the next thing we should discuss is the thing i've mentioned a few times already in this video the numlock trick this is going to make it substantially easier to play this build so the problem with this is that the 
Devouring Orb has a very low cooldown. Once you get yourself further into endgame and once you have Anomaly turned on, your Devouring Orb is going to have a 2.4 second cooldown. This means that stopping and consistently having to repress it yourself every single time might get pretty annoying to do and it might be really, really unfun. Well, what we could do is we can simply just numlock the skill like this, which makes it so the game is going to automatically be casting Devouring Orb for me every single time it's up. Now, doing this is very simple to do. All you need to do is first you need to have a numpad on your keyboard and if you don't have a numpad on your keyboard i'm sure there's probably a way for you to figure out a solution to get yourself a numpad or to be able to bind numlock through your keyboard software but i'm going to assume you have a numpad here all you're going to be doing is just going to settings going under gameplay and then you're going to be changing input keys all you do here is you are simply going to be turning on your numpad and then you're going to be adding a secondary key bind to whatever abilities you want the game to automatically use for you so in my case i have ability 3 and ability 4 as keypad 7 and keypad 8 and those are going to be the two that we're going to be using for this example then all i have to do is simply turn on my numpad so the little light is on and then i'm going to be holding the numpad keys for whatever abilities that i want to automatically be casted so as you can see here for devouring orb if you look at the icon for it you see how it's all bright and if i hold down the key the icon turns bright even past the little cooldown spike you want to be holding your key down like this so it is dark and you're obviously auto casting it and then as you're holding down this key you just simply toggle your numlock again so the light goes off and as you can see with you taking your hand off of your keyboard the ability is still going to be darkened out and as you can see without you having to do anything your character is just going to sit here and just keep auto casting the ability for you now we cannot do this for every ability for example we cannot numlock smite if you were to numlock something that doesn't have a cooldown for example if i were to numlock sigils of hope what my character would do is sit here and just spam sigils of hope every time i have mana for it without me being able to play the game obviously it's going to stop every time i have no mana but the problem here is going to be that well i don't have mana if you were to do this with another skill that didn't really cost mana your character would effectively just not be able to play the game so for example if i were to put on rive as you can see my character is just going to sit here and rive every single time the rive is up without me being able to play the game so unfortunately this is only going to be something that's viable for abilities with a cooldown, such as Devouring Orb and Anomaly in our case. Now that we've got the Numlock trick out of the way, I want to very quickly talk about the other skills that we're going to be adding to this build and how they're going to be helping us. So the first major thing to mention here is going to be Anomaly. You're going to be getting Anomaly right before you get to Monoliths, and Anomaly is going to be the thing that makes this build go from very good to absolutely silly. Anomaly is a skill that is going to mess with time, but we don't really care about the whole time messing mechanic of it. And instead, we're going to be picking up Time Bubble, so it creates a bubble every time we use it. And then we're going to be picking up Time Lord so that the bubble is centered around us. Now that the bubble is always on top of us, we can pick up a lot of passive points that are going to give us a lot of useful buffs if we are inside the bubble. First off, you're going to be picking up a Swift Rest, which is going to give us 30% cooldown recovery speed, which is going to be amazing. That just means we get to do 30% more Devouring Orbs, as well as picking up two points at the Time Eater, which is going to give us 1% health leech as well as doubling our void leech which is great because we're gonna have four points into world eater on our passive tree giving us four percent generic void leech meaning that with time eater it's going to be doubled to eight percent and we are then going to pick up four points into void maw void maw is just going to double the effectiveness of all the leech that you have so time eater is taking our four percent void leech doubling it to eight and then void maw is taking that eight and doubling it again to 16 meaning we're gonna have an unbelievable amount of void leech especially since we have permanent uptime on anomaly very easily and at higher budget levels we are then going to be picking up decimation which is going to give us a lot of free critical strike chance it's going to massively scare our dps anomaly is going to be great for this build and even if it just gave us 30 percent cooldown reduction and it didn't give us anything else or didn't give us any sort of leech it still basically is a mandatory skill the final thing i want to mention about this is that any monster that's going to be inside your bubble is going to have two stacks of void res shred applied 10 per second void res shred can only stack up to 10 times and it gives you five percent void resistance shred against whatever you're fighting that means that whatever is inside the bubble is going to eventually be taking 50 percent more more void damage from you and time bubble by itself can very easily keep up 10 sacks the other support skill that we're going to be adding onto this is sigils of hope now sigils of hope is going to give you three additional flat fire damage per sigil you have active and you can have three of them active and with decree of flame we're going to be gaining an additional three effectively doubling the effectiveness of sigil of flame what we're then going to be doing is we're going to pick up sigils of despair which means that each of those sigils is going to give us six flat void damage as well as additional 15 percent generic void damage per sigil we have active we can then pair this up with something like last wish which makes it so these sigils are auto summoned when we are doing monoliths meaning we should never have to worry about manually casting it it just becomes a passive buff and then we can pick up enduring hope which makes it so their uptime is going to be a lot higher and we can pick up tetragram which is going to make it so we have four sigils giving us an additional plus six free void damage sigils of hope are going to basically double your dps simply because flat damage is that powerful in this build and they're going to be a no-brainer to have now unfortunately that does mean on bosses you're going to have to manually cast them but because they have a 15 second base duration and with enduring hope they go to 25 seconds it's not really that bad to do and because you're not gonna have any mana problems due to smite giving you a lot of mana back it should be 
be very easy to fit these in every 25 seconds in a boss. The next thing we should discuss is going to be the gear that you want for this build. So the very nice thing about this is that you don't need a singular unique item for this build. You're going to basically want to use exalted items all the way up until end game until you get very powerful uniques such as Ravenous Void and Omniverence. Those two uniques are very rare and they're not going to be something you're going to worry about until you get to an absolute high-end min-max setup. So realistically, they're just something you don't have to worry about. The rest of your gear is just going to be used to get as many usable stats as possible. So the first thing I want to mention about stats is going to be cooldown reduction. This is so crucial to your build that you do not care what else is going to be on your belt and your boots if it does not have cooldown recovery speed on it. Literally a belt with no prefixes and no suffixes on it, but cooldown recovery speed is stronger than a belt with any other rules on it. And the same goes for your boots. Cooldown recovery speed is a massive role for this build because it's going to not only help you keep anomaly up with 100% uptime, but it's also going to make it so you spam more devouring orbs. It's going to greatly reduce the cooldown of them, allowing you to have substantially smoother clear due to you having more devouring orbs up at any given time. Cooldown recovery speed is both a suffix that can only roll on your belt and boots, and you really need to make sure that you get this on both of your items. It doesn't matter if your boots don't have movement speed, for example. It doesn't matter if your boots don't have life or vitality. You absolutely need to make sure you get cooldown recovery speed on both of these items. Ideally, you're going to want to make sure you get vitality on your helmet, on your chest plate, and on your boots, as that is the three places where vitality can actually roll, as well as looking for as much crit chance as you can on a bunch of your pieces. Now, the nice thing about crit chance is it can roll all over the place, and there's multiple rolls of it, which makes it very easy for you to get some sort of crit chance. You get crit chance on your gloves, on your weapon, on your offhand, on your amulets, on your rings, and on your relic. And there are going to be multiple versions of it. There's going to be generic crit chance, which works for everything, and there's going to be specifically spell crit chance. There's no difference between the two, other than that the spell crit chance has a bigger role because it's a specific type of crit chance rather than a generic one. So if you ever have the choice between being able to pick up either spell crit chance or normal crit chance, always go for spell crit chance. Lastly, the most important thing here to mention is you're going to want to find yourself a helmet with additional levels to devouring orb. Ideally, you'd eventually get yourself an exalted one with plus three or plus four devouring orb, and it's going to give you an unbelievably large amount of extra dps but realistically any devouring orb helmet is going to be great and ideally you would look for devouring orb helmets to scrap to get more devouring orb shards to be able to upgrade the levels of devouring orb on a very good helmet base finally what we'd want to do for suffixes is just going to be using them for resistances now ideally as you push into end game you're going to want to have your resistances be taken care of by blessings and by idols but early on especially as you get to monoliths you are just going to be using all of your suffixes to get any resistances you need now the very nice thing about this build is we're going to have a very easy time with resistances. That is due to us picking up Abyssal Endurance, which is going to give us around 40% Void Resistance and Physical Resistance for free, as well as us getting 8 points into Juggernaut on the base Sentinel Tree, which is going to give us another 24 Void Resistance and 24 Fire Resistance. This means that you're basically going to be Void Resistance capped for free for playing this build, as well as you having a decent chunk of your Physical Resistance taken care of, and having a decent chunk of Fire Resistance. Finally, in the Paladin Tree, we're going to be picking up a few points of Defiance, giving you a little bit more Elemental Resistance, effectively allowing you to have about half of the resistances that you actually need satisfied by your passive tree in total. The final thing to mention here is that we're going to be stacking vitality, and each point of vitality is going to give you 1% poison and necrotic resistance, meaning at high budget levels, once we start pushing 90 plus vitality, you are going to literally need zero necrotic and zero poison resistance on your gear. Because of all this put together, you are going to have the majority of resistances completely taken care of, so you don't really need that many resistance to roll in all of your gear, but try to do whatever you can to get resistance capped as soon as you can. You don't need to be res capped immediately, you only need to be res capped by the time you get to empowered monoliths, but because it's so easy to do, you might as well do it for additional defensive layer. For the rest of your suffixes, you are going to basically be looking for two things. You're just going to need to get health and armor everywhere you can. Armor is a really good defensive sat because armor works not only on physical damage but also on all of the damage types at 70 percent effectiveness as for health because we have such a great way of scaling our raw health through vitality getting any sort of percent increased health on any of your armor is going to be a really big ehp increase because you already have a lot of flat but you don't have much increased health the other thing to mention here is that you're going to really want to get yourself a vitality on hit suffix somewhere this can either roll on your amulets your gloves or your relic and it's just going to make it so every stack of frailty on an enemy is going to make them do six percent less damage stacking up to three times this is an amazing defensive layer and because of how many small hits we're doing in this build you only need to get a basic roll of it and should be able to keep itself up at three stacks on bosses very easily the Final thing to mention here is that you're then going to also want to look for armor res on hit on both your amulets, your gloves, and your relic. This is a massive role for this build and it's going to increase the DPS of it by a very large amount because armor shred just makes you just do overall more damage. With just a singular armor shred roll on your amulet, you will very easily be able to get to 30 to 40 armor shred sacks, which is going to give you somewhere around 30% more void damage. That single roll is basically as strong as half of your gear put together, meaning that it's something you can't really skip out on. Overall, gearing this character is very simple simply because 
because you just want resistances and you just want as much generic void damage and crit chance as you can all over the place. And because you don't need a single unique item, it's very easy to get it going. The final thing I want to mention in terms of minboxing this character and things to look out for would be an experimental haze spirit boots. Now, the experimental haze mod is absolutely cracked. Not only is it going to give you anywhere between one to three seconds of haze, depending on the role of it, but it also increases the effect of haste. Now, we don't have a way to get haste in this build, and what haste does is it gives you 30% increased movement speed. If you can get yourself a pair of experimental haste boots with no other rolls on it but cooldown recovery speed, that is a great place to start. Ideally, eventually, you're going to want to get yourself a pair of these boots that also have increased movement speed or vitality as a prefix, and ideally have a high movement speed implicit. The most important thing here is that if you are going to look for these, you need to be able to put cooldown recovery speed on it, and no other stat really matters, and these can be a very great upgrade for you to make in the mint game, and eventually an item that you can and look forward to upgrading and making better as you push into the end game. Next, let's very quickly go over the idols that you'd want in this build. So there are going to be three main idols that you're going to want to be on the lookout for. The first one being a large Raylith idol that has chance to gain inspiration when you kill an enemy with a void skill. Now, this is not required by any means, but it's a really nice stat to have. And we only need this in one place as even a min roll of 8% should be enough for you to keep inspiration up permanently. And this is just going to give you 20% increased cooldown recovery speed. Now, obviously, this is not going to work on bosses, but for doing echoes, it's going to feel great as 20% CDR just means you do more lunges and you do more devouring orbs. The other major relic that we care about here are going to be ornate solar idols that have chance of armor shred on hit on them. Now, ideally, you're going to have armor shred on your amulet, but there's no such thing as enough armor shred. The more armor shred you get, the better. Ideally, in this build, we're going to want to get somewhere around two to three hundred percent armor shred so we can get to around 80 stacks of armor shred. So, ideally, getting yourself two large ornate idols with any sort of armor shred on hit is going to be great. And outside of the armor shred idols and the inspiration idol, all you're going to want the rest of your idol slots are going to be just generic idols. For example, getting a bunch of Eteran idols with vitality and void damage or vitality and any sort of resistance you need are going to fit in great. And for any small slots, you can always fit in Lagonian idols with armor and health on them. Now, you don't need any of these idols. These are just the ideal idols you'd want for this build. You can instead just fit in a bunch of stout Lagonian idols, the two by one ones, that give you a bunch of health and a bunch of resistance that you need. Early on, it's very easy for you to just use your idols to be able to get yourself res cap a lot easier, allowing you to fit more armor and health onto your gear early on giving you substantially more tankiness. Idols are pretty flexible in this build, and as long as you just have either vitality or resistance or some sort of generic void damage, that's all you really need to be looking for. They're really simple to put together, and realistically, you can mix and match quite a lot of idols to get something perfect. You don't need any sort of mandatory idols to make this feel good, other than ideally, you really want to be on the hunt for the armor shred idols, as they're going to give you a pretty big DPS boost. And that's all we really have to talk about in this video. I hope this answered all of your questions on how to put together a Void Knight Auto Bomber, and if you do end up playing this build on launch, I really hope you have fun with it. This build is, as I said, the build that made me fall in love with the game, and it's some of the most fun gameplay I've ever had in the game. Just being able to lunge around and just watch my devouring orbs proc and explode 10 times as a single monster blows up in a pack is very satisfying, and it's just a really fun playstyle, and it's just so simple to play, and the fact it has so much movement speed makes it an absolute treat to clear monoliths with it. If you have any further questions on the build kitties, I'll be more and happy to answer any of them for you just leave a comment in the description below and i'll answer it as soon as i can or if you want to ask me a question directly i'll be more than happy to help you on twitch and if you just simply want to come hang out on twitch with all the cuties i'll be more than happy if you come and hang out with us as well i don't know what build i'll be playing on launch currently i'm either between playing this build or playing a warlock auto bomber experimental build that i'm slowly coming up with before launch but if i don't want to pull the trigger on the warlock build it's definitely going to be this one instead that's all i have for this video cuties i hope you enjoyed i hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and i'll see you cuties in the next video